Jock Jeffries. How are you? I am good. I hope you're well also. I am. I am. I'm glad to see you again. Same here. Yeah, you've got a beautiful background there. Just a second ago, I saw your dog changing from one couch to the other. He's living the life, isn't he? Yeah, she's uh, on her bed over here now. <laughs> nice, nice. That's living the life. Good to be with Daddy all day. Um, hey, Josh, thanks for joining us here, talking to contractors all around the world about business improvement. And generally, I speak about the kind of things that are taking a business forward, sales, marketing, time, team, money, uh, and all those things. Today, under the heading of team, you've actually got a really interesting topic for us about the world of benefits. Yeah, so employee benefits, uh, they tend to be a top three to five P&L line item for most businesses, uh, yeah. but they, they're the only one that businesses haven't uh, reined in the same way they do all their other top expenses. Yeah, well, maybe you could start it off like this with us for us, Josh, and everybody's heard me say this, who the heck are you? And why are you the guy that would be talking to a group of forward-facing contractors about benefits, benefit programs, especially at times like this when it's hard to get staff and you want to keep the one, the good ones you've got? Yeah, so um, I've been doing this about 20 years, and uh, I do it pretty differently than everyone else, uh, which is probably why why I'm why talking. We got that's today. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so my personal background, I'm a. I'm an MBA in finance and an SPHR, which is Senior Professional in Human Resources. And so I, I always say it's the intersection of people and P&L, which is essentially what employee benefits is. It's generally the second largest expense to salaries yeah. and or facilities. And so, you know, I've been doing it a long time and I've been doing it very differently. So most employers think of specifically health insurance, because it's the biggest expense of the benefits load as a product purchase, something to be bought. Right. And I view it as a strategic part of the business. So I build solutions uh, rather than buying off the shelf products that the, that the carriers create. Yeah. Right now it's so hard to find people. And, and, and then, as I said, even keep the people you've got, where do benefits fit into the employee retention or the employee, you know, getting new employees or keeping the ones you've got, where do that, where does benefits fit in that whole thing? Well, in competitive markets, like it is now, it, it's generally one of the biggest attraction tools um, because salaries in an industry tend to be benchmarked and they tend to not vary significantly. It's the benefits part of the salary mm. uh, total rewards package that is significantly different from one employer to the next. And so they tend to be a very big anchor for retaining employees and an attraction tool for bringing new staff on. Yeah. I've heard stories of so many people who just don't have healthcare coverage at all. Yeah. And in, in the U S it's a, it, yeah. it's a big issue that they've been trying to tackle since 2010 with the affordable care act and they've yeah. made progress. Um, but because of the expense, there's still a significant number of people that, that go without, or they join, uh, you know, Christian ministry cost sharing programs or, you know, other insurance like uh, programs. Yeah. Well, let's, let's jump in and talk about that, Josh, because you certainly are the right guy. And, and you're right. You came to me through some other channels, you know, people we know who know each other. And I've been looking for this answer from somebody like you for a long time, because my listeners have been asking me for this answer really all, always around the same thing. And, and I hear it as a side story, Dom, my wife is sick, but we don't have benefits, huge amount of stress on people. And the other side comes from just from straight out of the desk at the office. We can't keep guys. We can't hire. When I say guys, I mean people. We can't find people, having trouble keeping people. Or like you said, everybody pays about the same. Nobody's going to jump ship to come to us. How can we be different? And But benefits doesn't enter the picture because people don't know how it works or they think it's too expensive to take, uh, you know, put it in place, take action. How do we tackle that? Where do we start on that whole conversation? Yeah, I always start from a, a culture perspective because benefits ultimately in many businesses are predicated by the culture of the owner or the founder or the executive team that's running the business. Mm -hmm. And you'll have everything from the viewpoint that it's an expense and it's something that you have to have. Yeah. And typically in those scenarios, you get HMO narrow network plans that have high deductibles and they're not significantly valuable to the individuals, but they check the box that they have, have the benefit right? And all the way to firms that are very parental 
in their approach to their to their staff, where they view it as an investment in their people and in the business, and they have very rich benefits, and they'll pay a significant portion of that on behalf of the employee. And they're interested in keeping the employees healthy and having better health outcomes because they view long term that's going to assist their business to be better than the competition. So those are kind of the two endpoints, and you've got yeah. everything in between. Now, on that second endpoint, that sounds a lot like something that a family business, you know, where you've got four or five members of a family in a 10 person business, you might want to be, as you called it, more parental because half of the staff are family and you want to make sure they're taken care of and have the pit company pick up that expense, if you will. Is it, is that, you're nodding your head? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and within the structure, you can, you can design it to benefit different constituency groups. So you can have multiple levels of coverage within your plan and depending on how you discriminate, because there's, there are variables you can discriminate on, you can determine the coverage that you want in place. And so, you know, with family owned businesses, it's very unique because the other half of our practice is estate planning and business succession planning. That's, that's the other half and, of my business too, is working with family businesses because it's a, it's a delicate dance and it takes yes. so many moving parts. It's like a Rubik's cube of parts. And there's a lot of things that you can do in the corporate structure that you can't do personally. And, you know, what, what gets missed a lot of times is that, you know, while the health insurance may be 20% of compensation, you know, it's a variable component and the dollar is fungible. And so what I mean by that is in the United States, you know, the benefits a tax-free benefit. So the premium, the employer is not paying tax on, nor is the employee. And so whether you pay it in salary or you pay it in healthcare, it's still the same dollar to the business. And so, you know, some businesses will do very high deductible plans that are low cost and premium and maybe pay more in salary. Right. But in those instances, they're paying more FICA. And as the employee incurs expense, it's now an after-tax expense to the employee. You'll have other businesses that have very rich benefit with no deductible. It's all tax deductible to the employer and the premium portion the employee pays. And then when they actually need care, it limits the out-of-pocket exposure for the yeah. employee on it. So it, taxes play a critical role in developing the programs. In what, it's States. cash in your genes, right? It's cash in your genes. So I think you probably, there's probably a bunch of people listening right now, walking their dog who have decided, oh, I'm going to listen to the rest, the rest of this episode. And the dog gets to go around the block one or two more times. Because there are tax implications and profit, just cash take home. There, there's impact on structuring the business right for how much cash you put in your genes or the people in your family or your, you know, the, the people in the company you want to take care of because they're key operators of the business, which lets you step back. It's so interesting to have you on here because I think it's easy to overlook this with the answer that we hear so much in the media. Healthcare is so expensive. Nobody can afford it. It doesn't work. You don't understand. Our company's too small. It doesn't sound like to you that's the case. It sounds like there's ways to make it work. Yeah, and it depends state by state also. Um, so health insurance is very state specific. So in states like California, you, know, you have very li limited options because you have to buy fully insured products because the legislation pushes you that way. Same thing in Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia. But in states like Virginia, Utah, you know, many others around the country, you can buy individual stop loss, which is a component of risk transfer down to $10,000 per person, which quite honestly in the South, that's an individual deductible on some plans. Right. And so if you can risk transfer anything above 10,000 per employee, you can start to get into what we call self-insurance, which is what all large businesses in the U.S. do. And, and we have clients as small as 20 employees that self-insure their health plans because they're in states where they can buy the insurance at $10,000 and, and it's enough liability transfer for the business to feel very comfortable year to year. So let's go to that. How big does a company have to be, either in employees or in revenue, to be able to sit down and take advantage of some of these you know, really customized and clever solutions that you guys put on the table? Really any size because there's solutions for all different types of businesses. So the self-insurance is generally 100 or more employees, but, but there's instances where it works very well down to 20. Right. Um, there's other aspects of it, such as health reimbursement accounts in the U.S., where a business of any size can leverage that. So essentially, you put in, say, a $10,000 deductible or a $5,000 deductible per person, 
and the premium therefore is significantly less and the employer will take some of the premium savings and, and it's an unfunded account called a health reimbursement account where it's just a promise to pay claims that are incurred by employees. And because on average, 30% of your employees have zero claims per year or less than $500, you know, the average person spending about 3000 a year on healthcare, you can account for about 10% of your people that are going to spend significantly above the deductible. And wow. so in any given business that does an HRA, they're typically only spending about 50% of the savings uh, that they do from the plan design. And so the other 50% stays in the corporate coffers versus going to the insurance company's balance sheet. So, you know, you talk a different language than most people, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I just thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> I I try to put everything in layman's terms as much I as I can. Yeah. Uh, so I try to define the health reimbursement account because it's yeah. just an unfunded yeah. account that the IRS you know created under their rules. And it's basically a promise to pay. So think of it like your car insurance, right? Like you could have a zero deductible and pay a lot of premium every month, right. or you can do a $5,000 deductible, pay very little premium. And then if a claim is incurred, you, you pay the You're cost. Yeah. But if you're if you're putting aside enough money on a month to month basis of the savings, you'll have more than enough to pay that expense if it if it happens. Yeah. So the uh, and by the way, I said that as a compliment that you speak a different language, but I need somebody who speaks that language to walk me through the path, because I would imagine sitting with you, there's a decision tree of questions. You're going to ask me this and we're going to go in this direction. And based on my answer to something else, we're going to go in this direction based on my state, based on where I am, based on a number of different factors, you then go through that decision tree and you're like, okay, that puts you in, you know, the best option for you is this category here or this category here. Here's, here's what that means to you, right? Here's how it's going to impact your pricing. Here's how it's going to impact your overheads, correct? Yeah. And then that's the key, right? I mean, too much in our industry, it's a sales culture, right? So you've got it, you've got these publicly traded companies, United Healthcare, Cigna, Aetna, yeah. They're operating in the best interests of their shareholders, which they're required to do as a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always tell my clients, if you're sponsoring a health plan, you better be buying their stock at the same time, because what they take out of your left pocket as an employer, they're putting back in your right pocket as a shareholder, because these companies have returned four or five times the average S&P 500 return over the last seven to 10 years. Healthcare reforms have been very good to them. And so as an employer, you know, you, you have to get outside of that status quo because the status quo is I'm Cigna, I'm Aetna, I'm United Healthcare. I develop a product that benefits my shareholders. I don't have a sales force. I just have independent 1099 insurance sales agents all throughout the country. And I have to cater to the person that just got their insurance license to Josh Jeffries. And that's a huge it's, it's, it's variance in, yeah. in education and expertise to cater to. So the products are built for the masses in a way that is confusing so that it purposefully benefits shareholder return. And so, you know, if your insurance agent's just out there selling product, you're playing into that, that game. And so, you know, that's why we really take an advisory role. And to your point, that decision tree where, you know, the questions and how you structure your business and where it's located and the types of employees you're hiring, all of those things are factors into the tools that you use to build your, your health plan and, and your benefit structure overall. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, this is such an important question because, I mean, we have to take care of our families first. The reason that we're in business is not to have a worse life than just going to be an employee for somebody else, right? You could get a job somewhere that's got a health benefits package and take care of your family, but being a business owner who's all, you know, who's sacrificed so much to get the business up and running so much to get it off the ground to then not have at least the information to make a decision on a benefits package is it's ludicrous but it's easy to overlook as you know right things happen you get caught up in the business you forget to look at the insurance thing until you realize uh oh we've got a problem and most people view it as an uncontrollable expense which is it's not uh you know the problem with with health care and benefits in america is that it's the society has been trained to believe it's a, it's an, it's, it's a product and that it's uncontrollable or undefinable expense. And the reality is every insurance carrier in the country is really only taking a small amount of risk because inside the health insurance product, they're buying stop loss insurance 
from a third party reinsurer. A reinsurer, yeah. People, people uh, even I barely understand reinsurance, but you just for so, fun, do you want to tell us what reinsurance is? It's basically if you incur a loss above a certain threshold, say fifty thousand yeah. dollars, somebody else is taking that risk. So think of your United Healthcare plan. You buy from the they've convinced you to do a high deductible. So if the average person spending less than three thousand a year and you put a three thousand dollar deductible in, they have very little risk because the the member is assuming all the first dollar risk. Yeah. And then they know 10% of your population are going to have heart attacks, cancer, car, car accidents, premature babies. They buy insurance from a third party to reinsure those losses. Exactly. So they're really only insuring a very small tranche of risk. And the premium for that insurance that they're buying, they charge to you inside your premium. So you're paying to protect the insurance company from your own losses, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. It's such a convoluted system. And the more you know about it, it's the movement of paper and money. Yes. That, that yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a very simple product um, at, at its core, but it's been built in a way to make it very confusing for the public. Yeah. And ultimately, they know their numbers. I think earlier you said we, we know that 30 percent of the people in a, out of a group of 10 or a group of 100 are going to have X amount of claims. It's because the insurance company knows their data the same way I talk about on this show. Know your numbers. Yeah, we just have to know our numbers. Whether the numbers are good or bad, we have to know them because then I can make decisions. Well, the insurance companies figured this out. They, well, know, they know their numbers very well. And that's what's so interesting to me about the U.S. healthcare system is it, when you think about big employers or small employers, employers of any size, they control every aspect of their business. You want to control contract terms of vendors you're engaged with. You want to control the pricing of everything you're getting for the business. You want to control the data and be able to understand what's driving various parts of your business. Healthcare is the only major expense at any employer where they kind of throw all that out the window. You know, they, they don't control the contract terms because the insurance carrier does. They don't understand the pricing because the insurance carrier is setting all the pricing and hiding it behind the corporate veil. And they don't have access to the data if they're smaller because the insurance carrier says, well, you're too small. We're not going to give you any data. Unbelievable. Well, it really thankfully, is. though, there's guys like you that dissect it or translate it because I, I'm never going to know with a given combination of, of situations what the right end best option is. And then there's also unique options that come up from time to time because legislation does pass. I think if I recall correctly, you actually helped pass some legislation. Yeah, so I was involved in the language of the, what was called the Cures Act in 2016, which mm. is uh, National Institutes of Health, which is right down the street from my office. Uh, Senator Mark Warner in Virginia worked on that legislation, and he was an entrepreneur himself. He owned a technology company, oh. and he, he believes in a vision of the future workforce of America. So you think back, you know, the DuPonts, the Rockefellers, everybody wanted to control their workforce. Right. And so they created employee benefits and the taxation around it to give employers more control over those aspects of maintaining and retaining employees. Well, Mark Warner believes we're a knowledge based economy now. And so, you know, you take my generation or the millennials, they're going to have 20, 30 jobs over their lifetime. Right. And so why should their benefits or their safety net change every time they change employers? And so it was a theory of pre-tax salary and post-tax salary is all the employer should worry about. And the employee takes that pre-tax salary and they go buy a benefits package from a third party and they right. take that package with them employer to employer. So it never changes. Oh, wow. and so as part of the Cures Act, what we did is we put in uh, HRA language in the last five paragraphs of that bill. It's a 220 page bill. And that was the birthplace of what are called ICRAs today or the individual company HRAs that allow small businesses around America to fund pre-tax dollars for employees to go buy their own insurance on a, pre on a tax preferred basis. So you made a difference. Yeah, it was it was first time ever being involved in the political process. And uh, at the time, his staff told me these things take 20 years legislatively. Yeah. Um, and it took about close to five years from getting that language into that bill to the ICRAs becoming reality. So I, I see the timeline, um, but it yeah. is it is progress. And I think it's 
it's how the political process is supposed to work to get those things to happen over time yeah. that benefit American workers and, and American businesses. Yeah. So you've already started to see the, the bill that you passed having an impact on the street. Yeah, yeah. And I think it'll continue to evolve. So now we have all the transparency legislation that came under the Trump administration, which is really pushing by 2024 for everybody in America to have before they go to the provider, they'll get an, what's called an advanced explanation of benefits. So normally you get the explanation of benefits after you've gone. So you have no idea what the cost is going to be. And all of a sudden it shows up in the mail. Oh yeah. It you was 24,000. Yeah. yeah $24,000 right. charges. We've reduced it to 1200 because it never makes sense. The pricing in America um, and you owe $1,200. And so now you'll have that in advance of your service by 2024. How much does this impact having having benefits program in place? I'm going to change gears a little bit, but how much does this impact me as the owner when I go to sell my business or pass it on to employees or my management team? How does it how does it impact the valuation? I'm yeah, so, going to get for the company. Yeah, so it can make a pretty big difference because if your benefits are really strong and it increases your retention of staff that plays into the overall value of your business. If you've got long-term staff that are highly valuable to the business, they're very well trusted by the client base. Um, also in larger businesses, if you do some variable structuring, so what I call the industry calls it self-insurance, I call it alternate funding because you're always buying insurance for risk transfer. Mm -hmm. I think the industry calls it self-insurance because they want to scare people away from it because it makes so much sense. Um, and there's not as much money in it for the for the carriers. Um, but if you do that type of structure, you know those the dollars you're not spending on an annual basis are staying in your balance sheet. So it's pumping up your valuation. Um, and we've kind of gone the second generation of that, where now we're directly contracting with health systems for some of our larger employers at a lower reimbursement rate than what the P national PPOs are contracting at. And that's driving significant value, 30% savings generally to the bottom line, which is, you know, to, to, to save, I have a client that I took their spend from 18 million to 10 million. Mm -hmm. You know, that's almost a hundred million dollar valuation to that business. And, and if they were to, to transact. And so to do new sales, to generate $8 million of bottom yeah, line and profitability, fantastic. huge. Yeah. That's, that's a profit leap you know, we talk about them here as profit leaks, little places you can go back and look at your numbers, look at your own data and find out how you can optimize. We've got a couple of people on here who are in the 18 to 20 million total revenue range and you just save the company from 18 down to 10 million. Yeah, and so, you know, regardless of your size, right? If you're spending a quarter million on healthcare and you can drop 25 or 50,000 to the bottom line, that's a whole nother member to your team. Yeah. That's right. And, and you can attract the right people. And again, the, you know, markets always change over time. I've been through a couple of really bad recessions as a business coach and an entrepreneur. And this, the, the questions are always there. The questions just change depending on the economy, right? When things are slow, everybody's worried about sales. Well, right now things are crazy. People generally aren't worried about sales. They're worried that they can't find enough of the right people to build what we have to build, deliver what we have to deliver, maintain what we have to maintain, install what we have to install. We just can't find people and we can't keep them. And so this question now around people pops up and the question around culture and around values, which sounds like lucky charms and pretty flakes, but it really is the thing that holds our company together. So anything, anytime we can lean on somebody like you to help us be stronger there, then we're going to come out of this whole thing. Well, in some industries, and, and with COVID, I think some industries were, were impacted significantly and will change forever going forward. And, you know, you look at some of my clients that had the, the variable cost structure. So they were, instead of paying a set premium every month, they, they paid a very small amount to run the plan and then claims as incurred up to a limit. During COVID, those employers saved tons of money. And they were able to waive premium contributions from their employees during furloughs to keep everybody on board. You know, a less strategic employer of the same size that was just paying premiums on a contracted basis to the insurance carrier couldn't afford to do those things. But when your employees were staying home and quarantining, they weren't going out and having knee surgeries, they weren't going right. to the doctor. So, you know, it's small things like that that I think illuminate it for the industry, the, the power of getting more control over this large expense and how in downturns, it helps your business 
And when the economy is going really well, it helps you to provide a richer benefit than you could otherwise. So, you know, I think it's really interesting with the ebbs and flows of the economy, you know, how it enlightens aspects of a business that an owner may not have thought about before. Yeah, there's so much here. If somebody wants to find out more or talk to you or whatever, because you've got a large team as well, and we want to talk yes. to your team, how do we find out more? How do we just get into this conversation? Maybe it won't work for a company. Maybe it will. Where do we start? How do we find you? Yeah, so uh, Risk Strategies is the name of my company. So my email is just jjeffries, J-J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S at risk-strategies.com. And, and we manage all aspects of, of risk for a business. Um, health, healthcare and benefits are my particular expertise. Right. Um, but we have similar people to myself that go just as deep in you know, workers' comp and liability insurance and all the other aspects of a business. And so the, the key thing is you've got to get a partner for your business who is educating you because you need to have the level of expertise that someone like myself has, but you can never obtain it on your own unless you want to dedicate 20 years to a brand new business. No, you just never, and there's so, so many things like that now. You also can't be a social media expert and you can't be a expert at programming your CNC and running the office and being a great leader. And uh, by the way, coaching your kids little league. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you need to have a partner that understands that and is dedicated to educating you on alternatives so that you can make the best decision for your business. If they're just selling you a product, you're never going to optimize the plan. If they're just selling you a product. You're never going to optimize the plan. Right. Cause you're just lining up with the till and you're just buying what's offered. You're not putting together a solution that's right for your situation in your state at your stage of business, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it changes all the time. You know, a small business, you know, may start out with ICRAs where they're just paying their employees pre-tax dollars in a tax efficient manner to go buy their own insurance. But maybe when they hit 10 employees, they want to now have a corporate benefit plan because the benefits are richer, they're more controllable, and they provide a better platform for growth to get to 20 employees or 40 employees. Mm. And so you have to have an advisor that understands all of those solutions so that they can help you grow and make the right decisions to scale your business. Because if you're buying a group plan from the start, because that's all the advisor understands, and you're overpaying for insurance, it's going to make it harder to get to that 20 employee stage. And you're going to overpay for a long time before you, you find a mistake. So the, regardless of who somebody uses to learn about their insurance, how often should we be meeting with our insurance person? Good question. So most small businesses do it once a year if they're lucky, um, because there's not a lot of revenue in the smaller cases. So it tends to be a very automated process. Um, and, you know, really, you should have an advisor that you're meeting with. We meet with our clients at least quarterly. Um, and those quarterly meetings are really important because things change in the business all the time. And so those quarterly meetings are a ability just to check in and see what's changed and if any of the strategies need adjusted. So much here. But you know, the, the reason that people listen to this show is because they're looking for ways to start to improve their business beyond, you know, making, doing, installing, repairing, whatever it is we do. We're now looking at the business of the construction business. Well, this is an important part. Thank you. Maybe give us your contact info one more time as we wrap up. It's Jay Jeffries, uh, J-J-E-F-F. R-I-E-S at risk-strategies.com. Yeah, perfect. Well, and people can also contact me if, I mean, Josh's email is pretty straightforward. You can't spell J. Jeffries and we got other issues. Josh, thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. We'll have to have you back again when uh, something changes or you've got some, some more uh, tips and ideas for people on, on this whole world of insurance and taking care of our people. Yeah, there's, uh, there's new things all the time and uh, lots of strategies that employers uh, have a difficult time keeping up with. Um, you know, things like virtual care and voluntary benefits. And there's so many strategies that, again, having that advisor is, is critical to, to helping them grow their business. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.